Oh, <laughs> that's actually me <laughs> and Julia. So, hi, once more, welcome back uh, in in this room. Uh, 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 I, I hope you had a, had a good lunch break outside. Uh, we we are back again with a keynote, uh, the final keynote, uh, I shall say, of our two-day conference. Uh, I've mentioned it before, uh, the last keynote. Uh, what one aspect of uh, organizing this conference for us uh, has been, or one key aspect we tried to emphasize was to uh, invite a plurality of, uh, of uh, perspectives on, uh, on what open science for the social sciences is or could be, right? And uh, so we try to uh, uh, maximize uh, the, the, uh, the range of perspectives while also integrating, uh, giving them an integrated feel and, uh, and, and uh, integrated relevance to all of us in the room, hopefully. Uh, one aspect of, of this uh, for us that we were particularly keen uh, to, uh, to emphasize was to bring in expertise from outside of our immediate field of social sciences or the different fields of social sciences, um, the more narrow conception of no social science, at least from a field that has had its own, I'll say, maybe rude awakening uh, to open science um, a few years ago and uh, is arguably a little bit ahead uh, in terms of the discourse and dis uh, discussion surrounding open science. That field, of course, as many of you will, uh, uh, will have recognized, is, is psychology uh, in a broad sense. Um, and uh, we therefore uh, tried really hard to, uh, to uh, bring someone to Mannheim who, who uh, is very, very well versed in, in the discussions uh, surrounding open science in psychology. We are super uh, grateful and happy to, uh, to uh, welcome uh, Julia Rora today uh, to act as the representative of, of uh, open science in psychology. Oh, so no. that's now uh, uh, <laughs> the, the pressure that's being put on you. No, no pressure. Uh, um, uh, and who, uh, who will tell us uh, uh, something about uh, something from an outside perspective about uh, how open science has uh, come of age, if you can say that already at this point uh, in psychology, how the uh, discussions have unfolded there, and what potentially we as social scientists uh, can learn from these discussions uh, with, uh, so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, um, and yeah, hopefully be a little bit uh, more rapid in our adoption of. Uh, productive open science practices uh, um, than uh, we would otherwise have been had, hadn't we consulted outside perspectives. So uh, that's enough of, uh, from my side. I give the floor over to you again. Give her uh, a warm welcome, a applause of welcome, and yes, the floor is yours. Thank you for the super kind introduction. I'm super happy to be here and to talk to you. And I very much enjoyed, like today and the last day, it's super interesting for me to see what's going on in other fields and also to see how things kind of convert at some points, but also like the discussions are going into a different direction. So I'm less happy about the title of my talk. So first of all, I don't know why I put a Western reference in there. I, I realized that I don't really like Western movies, <laughs> so <laughs> this will not be a theme talk. Then, like looking back, it was seven years was a bit of a stretch. Normally I'm better with numbers, but it's a bit more than just seven years. And then there's the thing about that term replication crisis. So um, at least in psychology, we're having that big discussion that it's too negative and we should use different terms. And last but not least, and that's the important thing, um, I'm not entirely convinced that there are lessons to learn for other social sciences or whether I can provide you with these lessons. Um, I think it might be more fruitful if I tell a bit about what we've learned in psychology and then we could discuss about to which extent you see that could apply to your field or not. Because like um, Pear said yesterday, so one size does not fit all. And even within psychology, we do have these discussions that some subfields say, oh, actually, that does not apply to us at all. We are not running these experiments. We can't do that. And so I would, it would never occur to me that I could tell you what's best for your field. So um, this is the new title. So <laughs> it's the magnificent seven or to eight or maybe even more years of replication crisis, credibility revolution, or renaissance in psychology. And I have some success stories, but also a lot of work left to do for us. So, and we start on a positive note. I was kind of afraid that my keynote would be too negative. <laughs> um, so I try to keep it a bit upbeat. So a lot has happened since 2011 when the whole discussion got more public um, after the Daryl Bam paper, about which Jeremy talked yesterday. 
and also about the false positive paper which coined the term p-hacking. And so just one example, we now have badges. So now there are more um, 40 journals in psychology that offer badges to acknowledge open practices. Then we have had, like, had a whole like, large number of large-scale replication projects that have been published by now. Um, scientific associations have taken action, which is quite remarkable. So for example, in Germany, um, we have now recommendations for data management, thanks to, among other people, Felix Schönbrot, that heavily emphasize open data, um, which I think will have quite a huge impact on the whole field. And um, the American associations as well have taken steps to move forward and to acknowledge that openness and transparency are important. And then we actually got new journals. So we now have um, like three new journals, maybe there are more, that have been explicitly started like with a spirit of reproducibility, transparency, and openness. And it's really great outlets um, for all those studies where you're like, oh, this doesn't really fit. It's like a meta project. Nobody wants to publish that. It will take years, I think. You might experience that at some point. And in psychology, they are now like established go-to addresses to publish these things. And we've had lo lots and lots of like new institutions or initiatives popping up, um, such as the Society of the Improvement uh, for Psychological Science. Who has heard of SIPS? OK, so it's um, um, like it started as an annual meeting at the Center for Open Science, and it's now becoming like one of the central groups like open groups pushing for open science. And, but also we have um, something in Germany that is uh, called NOSI, which is a network of 14 open science initiatives that have been started bottom up at different universities. And um, we have the Psychological Science Accelerator, which is just starting, which is really amazing. And <laughs> Sophia is already making, uh, is advertising it already. So it's a collaboration of 350 labs in 45 countries. They want to coordinate their data collection to test hypotheses on a really like large and international scale. And so at that point I could stop and they lived uh, happily ever after. <laughs> but uh, like uh, Thomas Koenig already said, um, it's a never ending story. And uh, that is also what we're observing in psychology. So we are having a lot of debates about things and I think it's a good sign. So it's like we're on a, we've progressed pretty far, but now a lot of new questions and problems are popping up and I want to talk about these a bit. Um, so first I want to talk about open practices and badges. And I think badges have been just mentioned at multiple points in, in the talks here. As uh, so for example, Arthur Lupia just mentioned it, I think. And so let's talk about badges. So um, one question we've been asking ourselves is, do badges work? And I assume some of you will have seen that graph. At least I've used it in multiple talks. I know Felix is using it in talks. And so um, what you see on the x-axis is time. On the y-axis is the percentage of articles reporting um, available data. And at this red line, one of the journals, and you will quickly see which one, <laughs> uh, Psychological Science, introduced the badges to acknowledge open data. And what you can see is like super impressive. Oh wow, what happened there, right? So there's a second graph in that paper that is not being shown that open, often. And it's uh, the open materials. And you could see it's a bit less clear, so that is the um, figure that is not used that frequently. And actually, I just want to point out, so for the whole badges thing, I think people are very enthusiastic about it. There has been an amazing blog post by Hilda Bastian, um, who writes really great uh, critical articles, who talks about um, bias and open science advocacy. So um, I recommend that you read that, because it's not such a simple story that the badges just came and suddenly everybody did open science. Um, for example, one thing that people seem to omit is that actually, I think at the same time, and even like across journals, the number of submissions really went down. So um, there's some interesting things that haven't been uh, talked about yet a lot, I think, and I don't know whether anybody has published on that, but there seems to have been some uncertainty in the field, and so it's all like happening at the same time. So do badges work? I think we don't know. Um, it's hard to isolate their effects. I think um, if we had more maybe political scientists or economists working in our field, somebody would have told us that it's not that easy with such a design to figure out whether it has a cause and effect. But in any case, what we do see in psychology is that these open practices, so data sharing, open materials, and pre-registration have increased a lot. Um, and to give you a sense of that, here are numbers that the Center for Open Science tweeted. Um, so you can see that the number of uh, pre-registrations on the OSF is now at 22,000, which is 
quite considerable for something that was just kind of invented in 2012. So open data, open materials, pre-registration, and I don't need you to, to tell you that, they are very good things. So um, the increased transparency, uh, transparency allows us to check results critically. And it allows others to reuse data and materials so we can become more efficient. And we can conduct replication studier, uh, studies much easier. And it makes transparent which analysis were planned and which weren't. So pre-registration, um, in principle, is a very, very, very good thing. And so the question is, how does it work out in practice? And so we've had a lot of time in psychology to now observe this all unfolding. And there are some, I think, interesting observations to be made. So um, I don't know whether you've heard of the PRO initiative. Um, Felix already tweeted about it. So the idea is that you sign on to this, and then you only review papers when you can either get access to the data and the materials, or the authors explain to you why they cannot do that. So there might be valid reasons to not share your data. And so for my observation in my subfield of psychology, authors are actually super willing to do that, which is great. But then you get the data and the scripts, and you can't use them. So this is a repeating theme here. It has come up in multiple um, talks. And it's exactly the same in psychology. So you can't reproduce the numbers. Somehow something does not work. And so the question is, how many studies with open data are actually reproducible? And we do have um, one estimate in psychology, thanks to Tom Hardwick. And uh, so they um, looked at the journal Cognition, where open data policy was introduced. And after the introduction of that policy, 62% of the data sets were actually not reusable. So you couldn't do anything with that. And then among those that had reusable data, 22 could be completely reproduced, which is great. But 11 of those required um, assistance by the authors. So that is actually a very typical finding. So it's not just in psychology. And actually, I asked about that on Twitter. And um, Seth Ariel Green was super helpful in providing like a long list of other studies that had looked at that in different fields. And you can find the same pattern again and again. So returning to the advantages of these open practices, you're like, yes. So open data, in principle, increases transparency and allows us to check the results critically. But the existence of an open data bed, it does currently not imply that anybody ever checked whether the results are reproducible, nor even that the data necessary to check the analysis are actually being provided in a usable form. So this is like a big limitation. So it's like a lot of papers have open data. But can we do anything with the data? We don't know. Um, moving on to another practice that I think is less common than data sharing, it's a pre-registration. And so um, there was this very nice Twitter thread by uh, Sandra Srivastava. So this week's homework, assignment, uh, homework in my grad open science seminar was to find a pre-registered article, compare to the pre-registration, and write a reaction paper. And uh, so this was kind of like, kind of depressing when you see what his students wrote. Because the article that was published as being pre-registered was actually completed before the pre-registration was submitted. So much for pre-registration. Um, the pre-registration only concerns one set of analyses out of many, and even the set of analyses is not well specified. And further, the power analysis and sample size justification presented in the pre-registration differed from the sample size presented in the paper. Weird. So um, do we have like less anecdotal information how pre-registration work out in practice? So I do think some research projects are underway. I think multiple labs are working on that. There has been one um, study by Feldkamp et al. And they just looked at the pre-registration and to which extent they actually constrained researcher degrees of freedom. So they had like a checklist. Does the pre-registration tell us something about this or that? And they basically found in a random set of 100 pre-registrations that, that there were a lot of researcher degrees of freedom left. And so I think the initial motivation to start with that pre-registration was to somehow constrain these degrees of freedom. But it does currently not seem to work. And uh, so a good friend of mine, Anne Scheel, who is doing her PhD in meta science now, so she had that idea that she was just going to look at all published registered reports and look at the hypotheses in the pre-registration and then whether or not they were conformed in the article. And she thought that was going to be easy. And registered reports are supposed to be the gold standard. So that's where the pre-registration is being reviewed and in principle accepted. And so what she found was that it was very challenging, because from those peer-reviewed pre-registrations, 
it was often extremely hard to impossible to tell what the hypotheses of the authors were because there was so much like uncertainty in the language and so much just like lack of clarity. And so uh, Anna also let me know that she still thinks it's a good idea to pre-register because afterwards at least you can't claim you had a clear idea of what you were going to do. And but of course it's not quite the intended usage we had in mind when we came up with that. And so again returning to the advantages of these open practices, we have to add that yes, pre-registration can make it transparent which analysis were planned, but the mere existence of a pre-registration does not imply that this distinction is visible for readers of the article, nor does it imply that the pre-registration in any way restricted researcher flexibility, nor does it even imply that the study was pre-registered before the data were collected, or that the pre-registration actually, has actually been followed. So it's a lot of <laughs> limitations there, and I think we are like observing this in practice, that you always have to go back and check the pre-registration. And so um, the question has been coming up whether um, we have something like open washing happening. I think it's again Felix who used the term in a talk. And so open practices in psychology have went from like that insider thing that like self-handicapping idealists were doing to something that everybody wants to do. So it has become socially desirable in some way. And it's also discussed as a potential edge during peer review at certain journals. So for, for example, people know Oh, if I like pre-register, I get a better chance to get into psych science, and psych science is one of our most prestigious outlets. And it's even so, um, I think Arthur Lupia ta talked about how to catch fish, and I think the best way to catch academic fish is like to write something in a job ad, because people are very eager to provide whatever job ads ask for. And so um, under this link, you can find um, a list of job ads, I think most there are 15 now, I think, mostly Germany, but job ads that require an open science statement, and people are really reacting to that. It's really visible in the community. And the question arises, so have we turned openness into yet another metric to game? So will researchers try to fulfill minimal requirements to get the badge, and then kind of profit, even though the way they implement the practices might actually undermine the original purpose? And so I do think there's like a question, like I can't tell you whether that's really happening on a large scale. Um, I think there are also two different lines of reasoning um, in the open science community in psychology, but whether or not that should concern us. So I think on the one side, um, you could say, oh, those practices, they are so new, and so people will make unintentional mistakes, and subsequently they will learn how to do that properly. So you do a lot of pre-illustrations, and they are all kind of messy, but over time you learn how it should be done. And so I call it the sips versus gulps approach. So um, people have to do baby steps and start from zero, and we should encourage them whenever they try to do something, regardless of whether or not it really fulfills our ideal. And on the other side, there are people, I think, and I'm probably like tending towards that side, that it might be an issue, um, because if you reward an implementation that misses the central point, and that might be counterproductive. Now, people think, oh, I, I did everything right. I have all the badges. Um, my data is not reproducible at all. And uh, my pre-registration says something else. But I got all the badges. So clearly, I did what I was supposed to do. And so I think what's currently missing is like the feedback mechanism that such a type of learning could actually happen. Um, so I think the current challenge we are facing is we have to somehow define maybe minimal standards, maybe higher standards for when we want to award those badges and acknowledge these practices. So at what point do you get an open data badge? Like, does it need to be the correct data set? Does the data set um, need to contain the correct observation? Um, do your scripts need to be like reproducible if they just run when you click or not? And so I think it's a discussion to be, ha uh, to be had. And if we do have those standards, then we have to ensure that they are checked and enforced in some way. And, uh, I think currently this is very um, unsatisfying. So right now, some people will get called out on Twitter because somebody notices that something is off in their um, article with all these badges. But that is not a fair solution. Like, uh, that is just inviting people to be biased. And um, this topic has also come up before. So who is supposed to check all these things, right? And I think it came up for like um, open data before. So is this a, like, a job for the reviewers? So I don't know. I think a lot of people who have reviewed 
say, oh no, this is of course not my job, this is not what I signed up for, I couldn't do any reviews if I had to do that for every review. I think it's a bit of a cultural thing because my advisor, Stefan Schmuckle, always does that. And for him, it's not even like something to be discussed because for him, it's part of the definition of his job as a reviewer. So it's really also a cultural question. And then, of course, there's the question, maybe the journal should be responsible for that. Um, but you also heard about uh, Thomas Koenig talking about the issues with that. Um, there are some journals that have dedicated editors to reproduce analyses. And um, I added a list that has a list of six journals with data reproducibility policies. And actually, half of them are in political sciences. I don't know how that happened, but it uh, seems to be at the forefront. And there's also like our new um, meta journal, meta psychology, has one person that just has the job to rerun all analyses. But like I said, it's kind of like open who's supposed to do that. And then no matter who's supposed to do that, I think we have to make sure that we keep the workload low because that's what everybody is concerned about. This is adding so much work for everybody. Who's going to do that? Nobody's going to do that. And so I actually do think there are ways that we can um, reduce the workload to enforce these checks. So, um, and I just added that after I saw that talk yesterday. So there are additional tools we can use to a data curation, like Yard, which was presented yesterday, which seemed like a super neat checklist, and I've never seen that before, but it would be really helpful, I think, for both authors and journals, maybe. And then, at least in my opinion, and so that works better in German than in English, but I do think that there's like an obligation to provide a Bringschuld on the side of the authors that if they want to get that open data badge and the open materials badge, it's up to them to ensure that the scripts and the data analysis run smoothly. And so there's that idea of a push button replication, that everything should be in, a sh like in the right shape, so you just really like, if you have the right program, just push the button and you get all the numbers and maybe even can directly compare them to the article. And so I think people disagree about whether how realistically for example, psychologists are going to be able to do that. I personally think so if it's tied to um, the ability to publish, then psychologists get those amazing superpowers <laughs> to suddenly do things that they said they would never be able to do. Um, but I have another reason why I favor this, and this is not a scientific reason, but I do think it's a good thing to encourage early career researchers to um, work on their programming skills just because I think we are all aware that many will not stay in academia. And so this is just like a useful skill in general. So, um, but that's just my personal take. So I th I've heard other opinions here and I think we can discuss that later. And there's another like really, really nice idea because it's really tedious to compare a pre-registration to the published article. Like you have those two documents open, you need to have a big screen to look at it at the same time and then it's hard to align these two things. And so again, Tom Hardwick um, has that super nice idea for smart pre-registrations. So smart meaning sensible markup assist reviewers tremendously. And it's actually a fairly simple idea that the pre-registration has numbered points. And so in the final article, you can directly link to those points. And ideally, it would be implemented in a way that if you read the article on your computer, you just put your mouse over that section and you get the corresponding section from the pre-registration. And I think if we had that, reviewers would not be reluctant to compare the pre-registration to the final article. They would actually automatically do it because of course you want to see whether they are actually doing what they said they were going to do. So um, those are my like just general thoughts how we could move that forward. And then there's another thing um, I would like to talk about and those are the large scale replication efforts which I, I think so far really something special that psychologists have done. It's maybe starting in other fields, but it sounded a bit like um, other fields didn't have that quite yet. So um, these are three examples. I think you all know the Open Science Collaboration paper from 2015. Um, but there have also been like other attempts focusing on slightly different things. And so those large-scale replication efforts, and I do want to say, like, I don't think they are stupid or anything. They have done an amazing job in many different ways. So, for example, they highlight the possibility that replicability might be far from perfect. And um, so this is something that Josef Brüder brought up, that sociology has that, like, illusion of credibility. We don't have that anymore, I think. Maybe some people still believe that, but those large-scale studies show us 
oh, maybe it's not quite that credible. So it has furthered the discussion within the field, but it also got other fields, I think, interested in what's going on in psychology and in particular the broader public, which seems to be like a motivator to keep that conversation going because now the world knows that there's something going on in psychology. And maybe that's like a completely different point again, but I think they have also helped to establish that idea that psychology needs to be more collaborative, like large scale collaborations. And uh, I really liked seeing your project, which is like doing a similar thing in a different field. But um, you could also see what an immense effort it is to get so many people together. So um, I think it would really move us forward if this became more common and if people became more accepting of that idea. But on the flip side, so they really don't provide a generalizable estimate of replicability. So I know that the newspapers like to write this, like, oh, half of the studies or one third of the studies in psychology can be replicated. And, but it's just not true. Like, we don't have the representative random sample, which also came up in a previous talk. And we don't have that right now. I don't know whether we want to try to do that. So the question is whether we want to have that estimate or not. But currently, we can't get it. But some people assume we had that estimate. I think in some cases, they also provide us with information that we actually already had. So um, for one of the replication studies, like the many labs too, there was also a prediction market. And it was uh, performing pretty good. So um, there is some implicit knowledge in the field that people can predict what will replicate and what will not. And I think it's often closely tied to study characteristics that you can actually just look at. Like, look at the p-value. Is this kind of uh, odd or does this look normal and things like that. And so I think in some cases, um, they could, that could remove like the need to replicate a study because the replication is so much more expensive. And I think one important point is that um, many of those replication efforts, but also like single replications, they were not necessarily informative with respect to the substantive theories underlying. And so um, I talked um, about this a bit with uh, Peter Isaga, who's also doing his PhD in meta science and uh, thinking a lot about these issues. And for example, he told me that um, he has talked to the to authors of original studies. And so I think in psychology, we had a lot of discussion about like, how do you communicate failures to replicate? How should you involve the original authors and so on? And so I think we have kind of moved past that point where it's like, oh, everybody's being a meanie and so on, I hope. But there's still, um, for example, like disappointment that the original study that was chosen for replication was actually not that central to the theory and that it could have been more informative if another study was replicated. And so that might be like a post hoc justification, but I think it's a serious argument to consider. And so Peter also looked at how people justify why they, um, why they chose a study to replicate, and I think the justifications were a bit friendlier than what you saw before in the talk. So um, people often um, talk about like, the impact of the study, how often it has been cited, that there's like, methodological uncertainty, and of course, like one implicit reason is always like, well, it's easier to, to do a replication if the design can be implemented easily. And so we've also um, heard about that, that it's sometimes just impossible to recollect the same data if you're talking like about a sociological phenomenon. But of course, like what about other criteria? What about theoretical importance? And so I think we are already starting to have the discussion. I think we are going to have it a bit more. And so there has been one um, commentary by Kozadal, and they, so the title is very prominent, the costs and benefits of replication studies, but they are just like bringing up that point, we need to talk about that. Like when do we want to replicate something? When is it informative? When does the field gain something? And when does it not further sign the science? And so um, that kind of also leads me to my last point. That kind of wraps together the previous point, and so that's research quality. And what's open is good for anyway, right? So I think in psychology, at least in the open science movement in which I am involved, most people care about openness as a means to improve the quality of research. So it's not about openness per se. It's because we assume that openness has consequences. And um, what I want to say is like openness might, might even be necessary for quality. We can argue about that as well. But it's most certainly not sufficient. And I think psychologists are really getting aware of that now. So there's that question, will we get high openness, low quality research? And so people are now starting to talk about um, like selected blind spots. We are really pushing for openness and transparency. 
But what about measurement? What about causal inference? What about theory? What about explorative research? And um, I would totally agree, like, we are not doing very well on all of these things. And um, I think Josef Brüder also brought up these things as like, oh yeah, we've like, it's all discussions and we've talked about that a lot. And I feel it's the same in psychology, so you can find old papers discuss discussing these things. But I don't feel like we've made that much progress. So these are still urgent topics. And the question is, to what extent should we care about these now? And um, I think there are two different, again, like, I mean, this is a simplification, but two different takes on that. So there's that idea, like, first things first. We first have to ensure some basic quality criteria. For example, first, like, we need to make sure that the p-values mean something and that studies replicate, and then we can move on to talk about theory. And for example, uh, Naughton has a commentary where she, where she says, or like, if we can't even verify the original results through reanalysis, we don't need to try to replicate, right? Like, first step, like, make sure that the analysis are right. But then there's also like a bit a different perspective that is like fixing the minor issues won't do much if results remain pointless for other reasons. And so I'm quickly going to skip that because I'm already over time. So um, I think that is uh, very well captured um, in Talia Coney's submission to the Loss of Confidence project. Um, I've linked the preprints or ideas we're inviting psychologists to tell us that they no longer believe in their own finding. And so what Tyler writes here is, so first of all, my understanding of statistics has improved a bit since writing the paper, and it's now abundantly clear to me that a IP hack to a considerable degree, and so on, but then the important part is, I also now think that the kinds of theoretical explanation I proposed in the paper were ludicrous in their simplicity and naivete. So the results would not have told us, uh, so the results would have told us essentially nothing, even if they were statistically sound. And so that sounds a bit gloomy, um, but I think it's a very honest assessment of his own work. So the question is, what if stu studies are fractally flawed? So what if, if it's, like we have issues with the data, we have issues with the p-values, but also the theory is not informative. Where do we start? Now I'd say, uh, I don't know, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a fractally flawed slide. Um, so I really don't know, and I think it's a dis like a discussion we have to have, and it also loops back to things that Pear said that maybe you have different issues here in sociology. And it's just a general observation that actually researchers who have been um, concerned about these issues, like that go beyond openness, they are now piggybacking on calls for more openness and transparency because they are sensing, oh, we have now like the right climate to discuss how we do research. So I do think they are profiting from these discussions, but I think it's still open how we are going to balance these things. So um, I'm probably also going to skip over that. Oh yeah, I want to say it's not all doom and gloom. But so the final question, I was supposed to talk about what you could learn from us. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I got one thing that we can certainly learn, I think, from psychology. It's maybe a bit trivial, but um, so what has really helped to get things started in psychology and to get a broader movement is uh, community building. And so I don't know whether you can see this is us yesterday. <laughs> and so... Um, it has really helped a lot to just bring together people because for, I think for a long time people have been thinking about these issues, but they haven't been in, in touch with each other. And now thanks to social media, but also thanks to conferences like this one, those people are getting in touch and starting a community. And so there's a really nice podcast episode on um, the black goat with Fiona Fiedler. And she wrote a dissertation about a former re uh, reform movement in psychology that didn't really lead anywhere. And she was asked what she thinks is different now. And one of her points is like, now we actually have a community. Back then the people working on these topics didn't even know each other in person. And now we have that strong community. But I would also say it has a flip side, and we are also experiencing that now um, in psychology, that those communities like SIPs are perceived as being like super cohesive in-groups. And that also gives us some negative um, reaction. So you get some of this, oh yeah, you open science people, and I'm not part of your group. And I don't like somebody somewhere, somebody there said, and you're the outgroup, so this is not for me. Um, I think people get the idea that at the SIPS conference, we are just like, I don't know, practicing secret handshakes and praying to Brian Nosek, <laughs> and like <laughs> getting like tattoos of, with the names of the people we took down or something like that. And so the, the SIPS conferences I attended were very different from that. I haven't been to the last one, so you have to ask uh, Flavio whether, whether anybody prayed to Brian Nosek at the last one. 
But I do think, so this is something to consider, like how do you make sure that if you want to create a broader movement that people feel welcome to join and that you don't get that us versus them mentality. Um, another thing is, well, yes, getting existing institutions like journals on board makes all the difference. And last but not least, just because many people use open practices does not mean that they are always implemented in a fruitful manner and that they always improve research quality. And so um, we had a lot of momentum for this change in psychology, and that's also a good thing, but it also meant we had a lot of rash reactions. And I think it might be a good thing to have a bit like slower or maybe more thoughtful change. So I do think you could just observe what is unfolding in psych and maybe learn from it and not repeat our mistakes. But I think that's up to you. And so now I would li really like to hear what you think about these things and would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, very dense uh, and, and uh, information-rich uh, keynote. We, uh, I think there's a lot to uh, piggyback on uh, for the audience. Uh, so please raise your hands if you have any questions for Julia. Cheers, man. collect. Uh, hey, oh. thank you for your wonderful Wait, talk. If you collect, I need something to <laughs> take notes. Oh, Maybe directly, if that's yeah, okay for you. Oh, it's easier directly. for me, yeah. So talking as a, a junior scholar, mm -hmm. um, that was not so familiar with open science before the replication challenge or the registration challenge. Um, I feel like in our university, at least, you do counter like a lot of uh, back challenges, mm -hmm. especially from more senior or professors, deans, whatever. Uh, and I was wondering just if you have some thoughts, because we are a few of us that are really like enthusiastic <laughs> about all of this, but we don't really know how to move this forward or to like, if I talk to my, my colleagues and my friends, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, what is this pre-registration mm -hmm. beast and what are you talking about? So if you have some tips and tricks to have it like more sustained and more, um, yeah. And so I think that's a very like classic situation, how it starts at many universities. It's early career people that are like, oh, I, I, I'm reading up on all of these things. This is really important. And then all the faculty is like, meh. Um, so, one, yeah. so one thing um, that has been really helpful for many people is to invite external speakers, which makes all the difference. Like if it's somebody from the outside coming, um, that might help. And you can do like, you try to make a strategic decision. So I think in some cases, it is good to maybe invite a respected senior person who's on board with these things because it might have a bigger impact on um, like maybe the more old school faculty. And so what um, I think might all be also super helpful, so if you're in a specific substantive field, then it could be super helpful to get somebody out of that substantive field and talk about how they are implementing it in their work because then people don't get that idea, oh, that works for other people but not for me. And so um, if you need help finding a speaker, um, you can also like, we can talk about that later. So we have some lists and um, ideas for people who might be suitable. Yeah, thank you for the talk and the nice overview over the state and development in psychology. Um, the two thoughts or one question, uh, I mean, what your field experience is kind of a rupture. So in a very short period of time, things changed a lot, which is what you would not expect. I mean, it's related to the first question because disciplines are um, resistant to change. So what, what would you say, what was the, what is the course? How can you explain that so much change was achieved in so little time? So sometimes there was reference to the BEM study, but it can't re really just be one article, mm -hmm. however weird it might be, as it triggers uh, this change. And the second point is, um, so I totally agree. I was also thinking about it before then, or after you mentioned it. So why I like what the Odom Institute is doing and what Yard is doing, but I mean, why do we do so much effort to make code uh, executable? Because it's the, the author's fault that it's not executable, right? And mm -hmm. um, we spend a lot of money, or mm -hmm. money is spent to help the authors. So it would be better to reverse the proof of uh, burden of proof mm -hmm. that the authors can show now it's running, and then we can mm -hmm. submit it. So it would still some work to need to be done, but uh, I think the authors actually should do more than they do at the moment. Mm -hmm. So for the first question, like why psychology and maybe also why now, how did this change came about to be? So I think one big issue, uh, one big thing is like it's always like a post-talk narrative I'm imposing on that. 
And I don't know whether you had like Duncan Watts, like everything is obvious once you know the answer. <laughs> and since I read that, I'm like super careful about uh, assuming that I can explain why things happened. Um, so I think um, one thing is that in psychology, we had people pushing for certain things earlier. Um, so there was already, there are resources from the 70s where you can read up on a lot of issues and people are like, wow, Paul Meal knew everything, right? But so when, why did it suddenly start that people start, uh, started discussing that more seriously? And so I do think that really like social media made a difference because a lot of things are happening on Facebook in like two very large groups with uh, like psychologists and a lot of professors are in these groups and actually discussing these issues. And that suddenly gave like a way for them to connect and for skeptical people to connect and so on. I think there was certainly a factor that contributed. And then I'm not sure how instrumental that Daryl Bem study really was. It makes for a very good narrative if you like give a talk on the replication crisis and start with that experiment. Um, I'm not sure. So for my advisor, he certainly explained it to me that way. Like he saw that study and he was like, oh shit, like something is really wrong with how we do science because if we can arrive at that conclusion, we could basically find anything without any validity. So it might also be in inter-individual differences in which thing started people to get involved in it. And then for your se second question, I actually like completely agree with you. So and that's my personal um, opinion and maybe I'm a bit privileged because I do think I have the skills to write like a readable script that reproduces the numbers, but I do think it should be the author's job that would even be maybe in favor of like enforcing autom automatic checks. So if you write your manuscript in Markdown, then you can make it that the numbers are generated like when you, uh, when you compile the script. And I actually do think there would be ways to like make this in an automatic manner. I also do think that we would need to make sure that we have a lot of like teaching involved in that as well. And I think for the early career researchers, it might be much easier um, than for the, for the older people to get used to that. But I do think it's possible. Hi, uh, Julia. Thank you so much for this. Um, this, is, this is on. OK. Um, so um, I've, I could have taken pictures of all your slides because it's very insightful. There's one thing that I'm wondering about if we can learn something from psychology. This is how can we um, remove this shame when you have been wrong as an author? Mm -hmm. How can we make human error really more accepted? Not that we want that, but mm -hmm. how can, you, can we remove the shame? Is there anything in your discipline, not just people saying, oh, we should all be, mm -hmm. a, you know, kind of, we should be like that, mm -hmm. but how can we do that? I, I'm just really puzzled on how we can get a culture change in that way. Yeah, Thank it's you. an excellent question. So I think two things. So first of all, what might be helping in psychology now is that we are like trying to reproduce and replicate so much that suddenly many people are in that situation. So it's no longer that stigma. If you only have one replication in your journal like in four years, then wow, that person will be singled out. But if it's going more mainstream, then it becomes common or more common. It still hurts, I think, but it becomes more common. And then that other idea, so it's basically also our idea behind the loss of confidence project. Because what we see is like people are very, very willing to like in generally, oh yeah, p-hacking has been done. Uh, practices were problematic. But like owning your own mistakes is something completely different. And so we started that loss of confidence project where we were like, okay, people can submit a statement about how they lost confidence in their own finding. And the incentive is that we are going to write this up into an article. It could potentially be high impact if many people subscribe to it. And so what we found was like a lot of enthusiasm. People love that across disciplines as well. But we got only like a handful of submissions. And even like I had twice as many people tell me they are going to submit then people who submitted. So we do have that cultural issue, I think it, it's remaining. And I think it's a very, like it's a learning process, it's a bit of a slow learning process because we have these norms of honor and reputation in our field. And I don't know whether there's any, anything really disruptive you can do to change that, or whether it's going to be like a very slow process of normalizing these things. I, I don't know actually. Hi, great talk, very, very interesting. I just have a question on your point about, uh, you agreed with the point that was made mm -hmm. that the burden of proof uh, that the code runs should be with the authors, mm -hmm. um, and I tend to agree. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the responsibility of other 
actors in the system, like the institutions mm -hmm. or the funders or the journals. Um, on you mentioned education as an important mm -hmm. component, but in addition to that, um, are there what is the role of the other players in making sure that that happens? So that is a great point because so I'm kind of like oh yeah the the burden of proof should be on the authors because I think it's maybe the easiest way to implement it right now. Um, because I also see that issue that institutions can be like slow or also have like financial issues and that those are real issues, right? Um, I do think in an ideal world, everybody would try to take responsibility. So if the university can afford it, they should totally like establish a system of checks that helps the authors, right? And uh, makes it sure that they can write this code and so on. And actually I would also, so I, I know I'm not running a journal. I know it's hard to run a journal. I know there are financial constraints. But I do think that people are starting to run out of like where all that money is going for the subscription journals and why that wouldn't be like a way that they could actually add benefit. And so I'm wondering whether maybe um, journals will get a harder time of um, justifying their existence. And that could actually set an incentive for them to implement, for example, data editors and so on to actually add value. So I would be super happy if that happens. I just don't know whether it will. I don't know much about journal publishing. Any other questions in the room? Okay, Brian. Thank you. It's a, it's a great talk, but it's maybe a more comment on Nicole's comment, which I've only thought about for 30 seconds, so it may come out a bit dumb. But I'm just sort of going through my mind, wondering about, you know, what, what is it like to kind of have this revelation that you've made a mistake? You know, is it psychologically crippling? And then tonight I'm going to be in a hotel room and I'm going to watch a bit of football once we get back and... There'll be some dif poor defender who, you know, misses a late tackle and the goal goes in, and they'll play it 17 times. And they did that to him last week, and they'll probably do it in three weeks' time when he does the same thing. I've seen plenty of boxers knocked out and all this sort of stuff. So I wonder how quickly damaging things are. And mm -hmm. I'll just sort of wrap up another anecdote. There's a, a bit of British research that Dave Spiegelhalter always uh, refers to where I think it was surgeons doing some operations on... Uh, small children's hearts mm -hmm. um, and they had a league table and essentially one guy was doing terribly he was just killing these babies and they showed it to the guy and he said well I'm clearly doing something wrong and he was one of the, the senior British uh, cardiac surgeons and he said I'm clearly doing something wrong I'm going to ban myself mm -hmm. from doing any more operations mm -hmm. and he said I'm also not going to do any more until I'm retrained and I'm only going to retrain with a guy who's at the top of the league table mm -hmm. he does this six months later he comes back in starts doing these operations not only does he start hitting the average, that he's up there at the top of the league table as well. So clearly this is a big man who's doing something, you know, mm -hmm. a big, big hearted, hearted in the real sense of a big, uh, a man without ego who kind of takes his professional responsibility mm -hmm. very, very seriously. And, and actually he's doing something really um, very, very serious in the consequences of life. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe people can be a bit bigger than we think. I don't know. I, I totally agree, and I think it's also like, I think we have to foster these narratives. So now there's a lot of, I mean, media always has that negative focus, and it's like, oh, this person fell from grace, and this person fell from grace, and this person fell from But actually, if you look at the open science community, there are a lot of people um, involved, like Daniel Larkins, and if you look at his previous studies, it's like ridiculous, and he's aware of that. And so I think it's something we need to um, communicate. I, I think he agrees, I hope he agrees, and I hope he's not watching. <laughs> Um, so I think something we have to communicate more, and also like we have to stronger communicate as the open science community. We don't care that much about what you did in the past. Like we are not going to judge you that you did something that everybody did. But what matters is where you move on. And um, I think is it like senior researchers in our field are like arriving at the realization that they are not going to be burnt at the stake for their mistakes. But of course we have to foster these narratives of positive change to get people um, to be more willing to become one of those role models. It's going to be in the news right now. All the <laughs> past studies are ridiculous. <laughs>
But but I wonder if in in some ways something that strikes me as an observer for some of the episodes that have happened in in psychology and in, in both sides is that is it you you have some some of these episodes that have happened have have involved things where really really the scholar has has been able to build a lot of their reputation around uh, an idea that really had not been very well vetted, right? And in some of these other cases, the people who don't seem all that upset when their their mm -hmm. finding didn't replicate, it's because this was their eleventh most notable finding or mm -hmm. something of their their life. In other words, they had a much broader sort of portfolio of things, so that this is not challenging them. Uh, fundamentally in some ways. And I, and I guess it, the, the broader thing I might wonder is is some of these things about making replication less, it, like the moment of replication is in some ways too late for some of these things to suddenly mm -hmm. have high stakes. It's the, the high stakes of it is set up by the fact that, that people are in a situation where they have, have accumulated a lot of reputation and mm -hmm. advantage and prestige and consulting and TED Talks and whatever, before that idea has really been very closely uh, vetted. And so, so then, yeah, it becomes something where it is genuinely scary because it's this huge challenge to what they've built up. Whereas for other people, it's like, ah, mm. I've got a lot of other things going on and this was just one thing. That's a great point. And so I don't know how we are going to like handle the cases that are happening now, but I do think like for the future, it's also like the field has, so this is like collective responsibility. Um, like take Brian Wansink where no numbers add up, right? But it's like, so how was it possible that he had such a thriving career? There were journal editors, there were reviewers, there were grant reviewers involved in everything. So it's clearly you can't say, oh, he was like delusional or anything. No, these people really applauded his work. And so I think in the long run, we, um, we all have to take responsibility to avoid that people, I mean, and I understand it, like if you, got, if you got so much praise for a certain idea, then why should you suddenly believe that it's wrong? So um, I think this is up to all of us. One more. Yeah. Is it about like uh, people praying to one thing uh, to to no sake at uh, SIPS? So um, you mentioned that measurement seems to be one of the four um, things we need to do better mm -hmm. at. Um, would you would you perhaps tell us why? So. Um, so as if you look at some of those studies that fail to replicate, like the way things have been operationalized, is so extremely indirect. So you can't come up with that stuff um, if you're not in the, like, deep in the field and have read all, the, all of the other papers. And so I do think like sometimes it's just like, so um, my husband is a computer scientist and he reads some of those studies and he's like, wait, this outcome is like ridiculous. Like why would that measure this and so on? And so I think we are so, some of us are, are like including myself are so deeply entrenched in that we assume, oh, of course this measures that. But we never really critically checked it and also like why would we critically check it as long as we can publish it, right? And so um, that is like one big thing. And I think you talked about that earlier as well, right? Like what do journals accept and so on? And I do think we have to have a discussion about that. And we are already starting to have one, and it's uh, pretty good. Um, yeah, one more thing uh, that I noticed as an author uh, is in terms of preparing the R code so that it's runnable. And at least in my experience, it's, I think it's also difficult for the author, and I think they might need more support because like I, I try to use this red pack for example where mm -hmm. you have version control so that the R packages are somehow saved uh, and you, other people mm -hmm. have the same versions then but all of these things didn't work mm -hmm. I'm, not easily at least and I, I'm pretty sure if you try to replicate or reproduce my uh, R code it probably will not work all the time mm -hmm. so I think also I think researchers need to be supported there more and there needs to be better software so mm -hmm. solutions or whatever. So I think we, uh, right now it's a bit tough if, you, if we would say, oh, the author is fully responsible that mm -hmm. the R code is workable. So that's in particular for long-term maintenance, which also came up multiple times. And I think that's 
a great chance. So I, I uh, once gave a talk at EuroSciPy, so all the like Python people, and they have the most amazing tools. And it's just like we are not often getting in touch with computer scientists and so on. Um, and I know that some like people are like actively trying that, and I think it's the way to move forward. Like we need input from computer science. Good. Right. So <laughs> I see no more hands raised. Uh, so once again, uh, <laughs> heartfelt uh, thank you for Julia.